Hello, Woodman. We are so grateful that you are joining us this week. Ahead, we have a beautiful time of worship, and then Josh will bring the ninth installment of our 10 Words to Live By sermon series. Before we jump in, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of exciting things that are coming up. With this past week of cold weather and snow, it may not seem like it, but Easter is only about a month away on April 17th. We are so excited for this Lent season that we're in as we look forward with anticipation to the remembrance of Christ's death on Good Friday and what he did for us on the cross. And then the celebration of Christ's resurrection on Easter and the hope and eternal life we have in him. It's several weeks out, but we hope you'll plan on joining us for one of our in-person services. One important part of our Easter services here at Woodman is creating a welcoming space for folks who are visiting. We'll have thousands of our friends and neighbors in the area attend our Easter services, and it takes hundreds of us to make sure they feel welcomed, seen, and cared for. Whether it's greeting people, helping out with childcare, or showing people to an open seat, we hope you'll consider serving at our, one of our Easter services. For those of you in your 20s, this week is our next third Thursday. It's going to be an incredible night of worship, teaching, and connection with others in a similar life stage. It's important to do life in community with others and find encouragement and support in your faith's journey. So we hope you'll join us this Thursday at 7 p.m. For information on how to serve this Easter or info on Third Thursday, you can check out our online service guide. Now as we head into our service, let us turn our hearts to Jesus, the one who has overcome.
went out and death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history they're on across the men for sin for every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began
Well, hello, Woodman. It's good to see you guys. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Kurt, one of the pastors here at Woodman. And uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like these gender reveal parties have become kind of a big thing. You guys familiar with those? Everybody trying to outdo somebody else in, in how they let everybody know what the gender of their kids are. Well, I don't mean to brag, but my wife and I were like way ahead of the curve on this. Like we did gender reveal before it was even cool. Of course, we called it giving birth. That was kind of how, how we did it back in the day. But no, now it's kind of a big deal. And, and you might even recall a couple of years ago, there was a rather infamous gender reveal. Uh, a couple in California went up into the mountains in California, and their big plan was they were going to light a smoke bomb. And it was either going to have blue smoke or pink smoke. The problem was their little smoke bomb touched off a fire, a fire that they soon lost control of. When all that was said and done, it burned 22,000 acres of forests in California. The National Forestry Service estimates that they spent $40 million trying to fight that fire. In addition to those costs, there was another $8 million of damage done to property. The most heartbreaking, though, was a hotshot crew chief who was killed while trying to fight that fire. Well, as we continue our series on the 10 words from Exodus 20, also known as the 10 commandments, we hit one today that is about the issue of truth. And I tell you, for me, as I look at the, the 10 words, these 10 commandments, there, there's some that no doubt, the, these are, are things that, that are, are big things that we should be avoiding, right? Murder is one of those. That's a pretty serious big thing. In fact, civilizations throughout time have, have always said murder is wrong. But when we get to lying, it's just words, isn't it? Does it really matter? Does it, does it really go to that same level that maybe murder or some of the other big commandments are? It might be easiest for us to wonder, what is the big deal? Well, you know, the Bible has an awful lot to say about our words and how we use our words and the power of our tongue. In fact, in the book of James, James, who is the brother of Jesus, says this. He says, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell itself. Make no mistake, our tongue, our words, carry enormous power. And, and like that sad, innocent little gender reveal that started with a smoke bomb and ended in so much damage, our words too can set in motion a raging inferno of destruction that we cannot control. So as we look at the ninth word today, I'm hoping that we will will go away with, with two thoughts that will understand the power of our words and secondly, we'll understand why truth matters to God. So let me pray, and then we are going to jump in to God's Word. Father, I, I am struck today just by how, how awesome you are, Father, that you are all-knowing, that you created the entire universe, Father, galaxies that we can't even imagine, that we may never be able to explore. And Father, no matter how vast your creation is, you care about us, you know us by name. You are not a distant God, you are a personal God. And Father, you have revealed yourself through your word, your word that we get to hold in our hands. And so Father, as we look at your word today, I just pray that we would see you, your character, your nature, what you care about, that that would come forward through your word today. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be present and would make us aware of those messages you might have just for us. And lastly, Father, I would just pray that you would work through me and my failing lips and that your message would go forward. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to start, as we have this entire series, by looking at the ninth word. We're going to look at Exodus 20, verse 16, and we want to make sure we understand how did the original audience, that was the, the nation of Israel, how would have they received these words? And just for a little background, let's recall that the, the nation of Israel had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. And when God miraculously freed them, he brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai, and, and they were no longer this rabble of ex-slaves. They were now to be a nation a nation that was directly following God. And so at the foot of Mount Sinai, God unveils these 10 words. And this is the outline for God's law. 
There would be subsequent laws that he would reveal later, but these 10 words are the 10 major categories that God is communicating to this new nation of Israel. And in Exodus 20, verse 16, we see the ninth word, you shall not bear false witness against a neighbor. Now, we might have heard that simplified to do not lie, and, and that's a pretty good simplification. That gets the general gist across. However, I want to look at two different kind of phrases that we see here. The first is false witness, and then later I want to define who our neighbor is. So we see that it doesn't just say don't lie, but do not bear false witness. And as you might imagine, false witness is a legal term, right? It's talking about in a court of law, the legal testimony that somebody would give. And if you imagine 3,500 years ago, at the time that this law was given, they didn't have a bunch of CSI shows, right? There was no videotape or audio that we could look at. There was no DNA sampling. There were no fingerprints. We couldn't hook somebody up to a lie detector. Justice depended on the accurate testimony of a witness. The witnesses held great power in their hands. In fact, in Deuteronomy, we would see that if two or three witnesses corroborated each other, they gave the same testimony, somebody could be put to death based on their testimony. It was critically important that the nation of Israel was a nation of truth, that they would not abuse the legal system. But you can imagine, If the legal system is just based on somebody's word, it might be pretty easy to round up a couple of folks and and make up some lies about somebody else. Well, later on in Deuteronomy, the Lord is aware of this, and and so he he lays out the penalty for perjury, the, the penalty for bearing false witness. And in Deuteronomy 19, verse 18, he says, the judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother. I gotta be honest, there's a part of me that wonders what would it be like if our legal system still had a clause like that in it? That if you perjured yourself, if you lied about somebody else, that you would then become responsible for whatever you were accusing them of. A person's reputation, their belongings, their very life depended on a witness's ability to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. These witnesses were incredibly important. The next word we see is the word neighbor. And neighbor can oftentimes be seen a couple of different ways. It can be a friend, somebody that you've got affinity for. It it could be somebody who just lives in or works in proximity to you. Or friend or neighbor can actually mean everybody, all of humanity. And the good news is we don't have to wonder which one is meant here. Because in the New Testament, a lawyer asks Jesus. He says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers the question. You might recall he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, and he tells this parable about a man who's walking down a road, who gets beaten, who is robbed, and who's left to die off to the side of the road. And the man that comes to serve him while other people are walking by, the one who stops is a Samaritan. And a Samaritan would have been unclean. He was an enemy with this guy on the side of the road, and yet he overcame all of those cultural barriers, all of those things that would have held him apart, and and he went and he served this man. And Jesus says, that is a good neighbor. You see, when he talks about neighbor, he really means that we are to behave that way towards everyone. Who is our neighbor? It's those image bearers that we see and we encounter every day. And any image bearer of God deserves fairness, integrity, and honesty. You know, last year with my son Carter, we we took a trip to... uh, Alabama, we went to Birmingham, Montgomery, and Selma, and we were walking the Civil Rights Trail. We went to several museums and and saw a lot of different parts of our history there. We spent a lot of time in the Equal Justice Initiative Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. One of the things that was so striking to me were the names of people who had been unfairly imprisoned and later exonerated for their their guilty um, crimes. Actually, things that they did not do, so I didn't word that very well. One of them was Theophilus Williams. Theophilus Williams spent 20 years, 28 years in prison that was based on false testimony. After he had served 28 years, the key witness came forward and said they made up the whole thing. Charles Ray Finch served 43 years before key witnesses admitted that they were being pressured to testify falsely. Ricky Jackson spent another 39 years in prison for a murder that he did not commit. 
when the evidence was finally allowed to come forward and all of the witnesses said that they had made up testimony, the prosecutor dropped all charges and said the state is, com- is conceding the obvious, that this man was innocent. Over the last 30 years, nearly 3,000 people have been exonerated from their original guilty sentence, and those 3,000 people served a combined 26,000 years in prison. You see, bearing false witness is not necessarily a problem that is relegated to the pages of history. The ninth word, I think, makes the top 10 because our words matter. There are very real and devastating consequences to our words. And not just to those people like like I mentioned that had been falsely accused that lost decades behind bars. No matter what it did to their reputation, the impact that it had on their family is certainly devastating. But I, I think when truth fails and when justice fails, it tears at the very fabric of society. Scripture implores us and history reminds us our tongues are capable of unleashing great pain, destruction, and death. But God calls these people to a higher standard. Justice was to be a hallmark of the nation of Israel. Justice requires truth. The Israelites were to be a people of truth, and so that's what the ninth word meant to them. Let's take a look now to the New Testament. Let's see what the ninth word means for us. We're going to be in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. Quick background here. Peter was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus went with him through all of his ministry. And at this time, Peter is one of the leaders of the early church. And so Peter writes this letter. It was meant to be a circular letter, so it was written and copied and handed around to to many churches in this area, these early, young, upstart Christian churches. And Peter's writing to them because all of them were experiencing great persecution. And so Peter's writing this letter to let them know, here's how we are to behave in the midst of a culture that hates us, in the midst of a culture that is attacking us. Here is how we are to behave. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter starts with, he says, So put away all malice and all deceit, all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. He goes on in verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles... I think it's fascinating that he calls them sojourners and exiles because many of them were were still in their home communities. This is where they had grown up. This is where their families had lived. But he's calling them sojourners and exiles because you and I are not meant to be from this area. Our kingdom is elsewhere. And so there will be times where we feel like we don't belong. We feel discomfort in the culture around us. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on this day of visitation. Peter's reminding the church, just as God had done to the Israelites, you are to be set apart. We we are different than the culture around us. Our world around us may be known for malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, but not us. That ought not be true of us. We are a royal priesthood set apart. We are called to be different. And so again, we are reminded that it matters how we treat others, how we treat other image bearers of God. We know lying is wrong. And yet, isn't it revealing how easy those words of untruth can tumble from our lips? I want to look at three areas that Peter has mentioned here in in 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 1. The first is this idea of malice. Malice is the intention to do wickedness or the intention to do evil. It's using our words to attack and tear somebody down. Like, she's the worst teacher I've ever had in the world. I don't think she knows anything. Man, that kid is so stupid. They, they, They can't figure anything out. They are dumb as a stump, right? We use our words to attack somebody else. Sometimes I think we mask malice with the fact that we're actually telling the truth. Have you ever heard the phrase, brutal truth? We might say to a friend, you know, actually I don't blame him for leaving you. You're kind of controlling. Right, we might communicate things that we think are hard, but at the end of the day we justify it because we say, I'm actually just telling the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Maybe we think people deserve it. 
They've been hurtful for us, and now it's our chance to strike back. They're attacking our character, and so we're going to double down, and we're going to go after theirs. Maybe it's even revealing a secret that was told in confidence, but now the time is right because you need to attack that person for some reason. Scripture calls us in Ephesians 4 to speak the truth in love. Not sometimes, but we are to speak the truth in love. And Ephesians goes on to say, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Look, if anyone ever had the opportunity to use his words, if anybody was ever unjustly accused and persecuted, it was Jesus. And yet he's telling us that we are to speak the truth in love. You see, when we speak, it's not just our words, but it's our heart posture that matters. Is our goal to build each other up or to attack with truth bombs? Peter also talks about deceit, that our language can be deceitful. It can be cunning, concealing, misrepresenting the truth. You know, I started to make a list of just some simple exaggerations that we do maybe way too often. I wonder how many of you, your grade point average has gone up substantially since you left high school. If we've got fishermen, that maybe you're down at the river and you catch a fish, by the time you get back up to camp to tell everybody about it, that fish grew a foot. Right? Are you prone to maybe knock a couple of strokes off your golf score? If you volunteered for a couple hours on the weekend, you tell your people, your friends at work, I spent all weekend giving back to the community. They seem like harmless lies, but what it reveals is that we are really capable of just twisting the truth to make ourselves sound just a little bit better. And it starts to become an acceptable pattern of behavior for us. There's other times when I think we exaggerate to make a point. We say things like, you know what, she always badmouths you when you're not around. Or I tell you what, if you give that guy a project, he's going to make a mess of it because he always does. Right? We always overstate. We say things like always and and every to exaggerate our point. Rather than giving somebody the benefit of the doubt, recognizing the good that we do, we go right to the bad things and overstate them. Another way we can do this is is we can make ourselves a self-appointed leader representing scores of other people. We see this in church, certainly, I think we see this in work, where where you might have a personal concern, and when you get an audience with somebody who can do something about it, we say things like, you know what, everybody that I've talked to, we all think. I'm not the only one. All of us believe that this is wrong, and we think that if if we can gather more people, right, it makes our case stronger. What would it be like if we said, hey, I've got an issue. It's just me. I'm just speaking for myself, but here's my concern. It's not bad to have concerns, it's not bad to have criticism, but let's be careful about acting like we're representing a whole host of people. You know, sometimes I think when we're having conversations with somebody else and maybe we're relaying an issue to them and we kind of sense that they're not fully on our side, right? We're maybe talking about an argument or a disagreement that we have and we see that they're not really tracking with us and so it's easy to turn it up and you know what, I'm gonna start bringing some new stuff into this conversation. I'm gonna embellish the bad things that they have done just so I can make a point. It can be so easy for us to fall into exaggeration with our words. You know, another way that we can be deceitful is with half-truths or twisting of our words. Now imagine for a minute that we had two runners running a marathon. And most people would recognize that Ethiopia and Kenya have the world's best long-distance runners. So we had a race between one Ethiopian and one Kenyan to run a marathon against each other to once and for all figure out who is the fastest. And let's say they run the race, the Ethiopian wins. The next day in the Ethiopian newspaper, big headline, Ethiopian runner wins marathon. You flip over to the Kenyan paper. Kenyan runner finishes second, Ethiopian Next to last. (laughs) Guys, I want to caution us in the media that we consume. We tend to gravitate to media sources that we agree with, and I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I think we've got worldview, and and we want uh, media that comes from that same worldview, but we need to be discerning about the subtle ways that news and media can shape and twist the facts. 
And more importantly, I think we need to be aware of the subtle and not so subtle ways that the news we consume starts to affect our heart for others. Do we feel like it's okay to call names for somebody who disagrees with us? Do we overgeneralize people who see things differently than we do? Do we feel justified in our anger towards people we've never met because we think they fall into some kind of stereotype? Guys, when the media starts to consume and affect our heart towards others, it's a problem. And twisting the truth is, is not new. Right, you've only got to go three chapters into Genesis when you see one of the most uh, egregious twisting of truth of all time when Satan talks to Eve and he says, did God really say that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve tries to recount what she's been told from God and Satan comes back, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan is the master of twisting truth taking something, giving it the ring of truth, but then the hollowness of lies. Satan is the father of lies. He, he excels at twisting the truth, and, and we should not be following that example. The third category that Peter mentions is slander. And, and slander is a false statement that we make for the express purpose of damaging someone else's reputation. It's fascinating, isn't it, when you think about it, that in a weird, twisted way, we think by tearing that other person down, somehow it elevates us. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend a couple of weeks ago, and he was relaying this um, conversation that he was having with somebody else and, and really kind of an argument. They, they weren't getting along, and they were trying to resolve some issues. And so he's, he's relaying this whole story to me, how it went down. And when he was done, I, I just stopped him, and I said, hey, if that other person was sitting here at the table with us, would they say, yeah, you've pretty fairly represented what I said in that conversation? And to his credit, he stopped and he thought, and he went back over, I think, the original conversation, and he went back over what he had relayed to me, and he spent some time to really think through that. And he said, actually, yeah, I think they would. I, I think they would say, yes, he's, he's fairly accurately represented my position. Here's my point. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to be in disagreements. It's okay to seek counsel. But when we disagree, when we argue with somebody else, let's at least represent them well. Let's be able to say at the end of the conversation, yes, if the other person heard what I was saying, they would say, yeah, I still disagree with you, but you represented me well. How horrible is it when we hear about things that somebody says we've said and we think, I never said anything close to it because our words have been twisted. When we disagree, let's honor the other person by at least representing them fairly. Let's not twist things so that we look like this virtuous hero while they are some caricature of a villain. You know, in addition to gossip or slander, there's gossip, I think fits in a similar category. And I gotta tell you, in my own life, I have said this sentence more than I wish I ever had. I don't mean to gossip, but. If you've ever said that sentence, or if you've ever heard that, it, it's a pretty good marker that whatever comes after the but is slander, you don't, or his gossip, right? You don't somehow get out of, uh, out of trouble for saying, I don't mean to gossip, but. Let's start saying, I don't mean to gossip, period. Let's stop that conversation when it starts to come into our minds and we think this might be going down the wrong road, let's just stop. Let's ask ourselves, why am I passing on this information? Is it because I love having scoop, I love being in the know? Is it to bring somebody off their pedestal and bring them back down to earth? If they were standing right in front of me, would I still say the things that I'm thinking about saying? You know, and it's not just gossiping, it's listening to gossip. That actually is not a passive way of involved, getting involved in conversation. Listening to gossip, I think, can be just as sinful because we're breathing life and breathing air into the gossip and we're encouraging that person to continue. So when we start to be in a conversation that feels like gossip, maybe that's a good time to change the conversation. Maybe that's a good time to say, actually, I think you need to talk to that person about your problem. Maybe that's a good time to say, hey, you know what, let's stop 
and let's actually pray for that person right now. I tell you, one of the cool things is it gets really hard to use our mouths to both attack somebody and pray for them at the same time. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What are your words revealing about your heart? If you have trouble with malice, deceit, slander, take it to God in prayer. Ask him to transform your heart and how you see others. Pray for those that you're tempted to speak out against. We've seen how the ninth word would have been received by the Israelites. We, we, we see now what the New Testament says about how careful we need to be with our own words. And now I want to look at why this matters to God. And to do that, I tell you, there were so many different verses I could have chosen. Right? And, and these ten words of Exodus, while they certainly show us an, an outline for godly living, I think even more than that, they show us the character of God, what he cares about. Right? The, the ten words are expressing things that God cares about, the matters of his heart. They demonstrate his character, and not just the behaviors he wants, but who he is. And we see that he is a God of truth and justice. Those things matter to him. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Numbers 23, verse 10 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Jeremiah 10.10, 10, the Lord is the true God. Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. And John 14.6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. All of these verses paint a picture of God. And I tell you what, if you're a note taker, this is the one note you ought to take. If you're going to remember one thing from this message, it's this one. God is truth. Now, let me be clear of what I did not say. I did not say God is truthful. God is truth. You see, I think it's all too easy for us to, we kind of create our own list of truth, right, of what we think is true. And we've got our list and we're kind of proud of it. Here's all the stuff that's true to me. And then we say, oh, God's got a list. Oh, that's great. What's on your list? Hey, that's on my list too. Good job. What else is on your list? Oh, I don't, I don't like that one. I don't agree with that one. I can't follow a God who would say that. His truth doesn't align with my truth. And, and all too often when that happens, we, with, with our limited knowledge, for me, my 53 years on earth, I think I've got a better handle on truth than the all-knowing, all-present God of the universe who has no beginning and no end. Think of the audacity to say, I think, God, my truth makes more sense than yours. And when they don't align, man, what, what kind of arrogance for us to say, when my truth disagrees with yours, God, I think I'll, I think I'll follow mine. And yet that's what we see so often in the world today. We, we think that God has given us the ability to vote on truth. Whatever 51% of us say that that ought to be truth or whichever way the, the cultural winds blow, that ought to be truth. Society or culture around us would have us believe that there is no objective truth. Think about that statement for a minute. There is no objective truth. That's actually a statement of absolute truth, isn't it? Like it doesn't make any sense. We are to be his image bearers. And a part of God's image is truth, and so you and I are to be a people of truth. In John 8, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in, them, in him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've got this war for truth, and we've got God and truth on one side. We've got Satan and lies on the other. Also from John, chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, The devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, guys, when we choose truth, 
we choose God. When we choose truth, we act in his character. When we choose truth, we love our neighbors, those same people that Christ died for. We are to be a people of truth and honesty because we are to, tr- to point to the truth. Uh, imagine for a minute a family that is uh, taking a, f- a vacation from Colorado Springs and, and they want to go see the Grand Canyon. And maybe dad, the night before, he downloads this like discount map app, right? And so he's using that and they're driving and they're like five days into their trip. And he looks out and he notices a North Carolina sign. And he thinks, man, something's wrong, right? You know, the thing is, the Grand Canyon didn't move. The Grand Canyon isn't any less magnificent. It isn't any less beautiful, awe-inspiring. It's still sitting there, but this guy is hopelessly lost because he was following bad instructions. You and I are like that app. We, We are the map. We are the one that is pointing to the Lord. And if we aren't truthful, if we struggle with that, we are getting people so confused, they don't know which way to go. It doesn't actually affect or impact God. But our job is to point to Jesus, to point to the truth, and so our testimony must be truthful. We are to be a people of truth. Jesus again said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We must be known as a people of truth because we serve the God who is truth. Look, make no mistake, when we are a people of truth, it will get noticed. It will stand out. All too often in in the business sphere, it's okay to overpromise and mislead on the performance of products. All too often in politics, we misrepresent our own records, and it's perfectly acceptable to slander somebody else, to slander our opponent. In journalism, it seems like we honor clicks, we want more shares, we want a good story. And if those things get in the way of the facts, then so be it. On our college campuses, we teach that truth is relative. We teach that you should do what's right for you. Guys, we live in a culture that's enamored with lies. With lies. But we are lamps along the path. We are the map that points to Jesus. And so may we be a people worthy of the call that we have received. A people of truth and grace. And we testify to God who is the author of truth. Let's continue to strive to be a people who take on the very character of God. Let's be a people of truth. Amen? Father, as we uh, have looked through your word and looked through this issue of truth, I am just reminded how short I fall in so many areas. Lord, and so I I personally, I just want to confess to you, I I apologize for those times when I have not used my lips to glorify others, when, when I have not been a man of truth. I know, Father, that I have your forgiveness, and so, Lord, I would pray that you would help me, help my friends, all of us listening to, to take control of our words, that our witness would be strong, Father, that when we point to you, people would see us as a people of truth, of people of integrity, and so they would trust They would trust as we point to you. Father, we pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You know, as we've done uh, over this series, we we stopped and spent a little bit of time in reflection. And I don't know if you're like me, but when we go through these 10 words, I feel a little beat up every Sunday. There's some that I went in thinking, I think I'm doing a pretty good job in this. And then as I look at it, I think, oh, gosh, I got a lot of work to do. It it can be easy to be beat up, to be convicted when we're faced with God's law. And that's actually part of what it exists for, to show us how, how short we fall, God's perfect standard and yet we, we have lives that are sinful. We make decisions that are sinful. Even when we want to go in the right direction, it seems like we make mistakes and we're right back where we started. And, and the law actually convicts us of that sin and, and demonstrates to us that our best deeds will never get us into God's good graces. And I tell you, if the story were to end there, well, it would be a pretty sad story. 
the good news, the gospel news is that the story doesn't end there. That that you and I can be forgiven of all of those sins, that God chooses to see us as perfect in spite of all that we've done. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he sees us not as a sinner who falls short, but as a glorious son and daughter of his that he, he longs to welcome into his kingdom forever. Listen, if you haven't accepted Christ If you are stuck in that spot of just feeling convicted of your own sin, boy, what's holding you back? Maybe now's the time. For others of you, as we spend a little time in reflection, maybe you need to pour back over some of the words and conversations that you've used. Maybe there's some relationships that you need to reconcile with, some people that you need to apologize to and and make things right. Wherever you are, let's spend a little bit of time and see how the Holy Spirit might lead your thoughts now. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't Oh, I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense
He won't He won't fail He won't fail No And that is the truth of the gospel in which we stand firm, we stand secure, and we stand confident no matter the storms, no matter the circumstances, we stand firmly and confidently on that truth. And then that enables us, frees us to be people of truth, to not have to be ashamed or afraid to not have to stand on lies, deceit, gossip, slander, but we stand firmly and securely on the truth of who Christ is. And then therefore we live differently. If you found yourself in a spot, maybe this evening, whether you're here with us in person, you're with us online, and it seems as if for one reason or another, could be any reason, if things are just crumbling and crashing in around you. We want you to know we are here for you. We'd love to pray with you after the service. Reach out to us if you're with us online. We'd love to come alongside and point you to the truth of the gospel. Know that we love you and that we are for you. But as you head into your Saturday evening, head out with these words being read over you. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen.